So pretty much every motorsport championship these days, from F1 down through IndyCar, NASCAR, F2, F3, F4 and all the others, it's a pretty simple structure. There's a set point structure, you go through every race meeting, you score points or you don't, whatever the case may be, and whoever scores the most points at the end of the season is the winner. Simple, right? But that wasn't always the case, because back in the good old days up until 1991, Formula 1 had a drop score system. Basically, you had a certain amount of races per season where scores would be wiped off, usually your worst results. So in 1950, the best four results counted in a seven race season. In 1955, it went to the best five results in a seven race season. In 1958, it was the best six results in an 11 race season. In 1967, it went to best five results from first six races and then best four results from the last five in an 11 race season. And then in 1988, it was the best 11 results in a 16 race season. The general consensus is that it allowed for drivers and teams to miss races due to things like travel costs, driver injury, not competing at the Indy 500 when it was part of the World Championship and vice versa, and missing races because your country's racing union doesn't like rear engines, you know, the usual stuff. But the FIA actually never gave a reason for having this rule. I mean, in the early days of Grand Prix racing, you actually got penalised for not turning up. And since only the best X of Y results counted towards the championship, in the two seasons that Jim Clark won the world title, he actually scored 100% of the available points, because even his drop rounds included wins. And nobody before or since has done that. And it wasn't until 1991 that this drop score system was, well, dropped. And nobody missed it, nobody shed a tear, and it was now going to be he who scores most points will win. But drop scores have actually affected the championship on more than one occasion. Unfortunately, it happened to the same guy more than once, but we'll get to him in a bit. So first we have to go back to 1964, when the championship battle was between BRM's Graham Hill and the eventual winner, John Surtees. But if we're going to pretend to be your average F1 social media user for a second, I'm going to tell you that Graham Hill is the real champion here. Because this is 1964, where the best six results of the season count. So the results for that season will be put up on your screen. So, you know, as an illustration, with Surtees failing to finish at the Monaco, Belgian, French and Australian Grand Prix. While Hill, at first glance, has the better results. But if you look in the final column, you'll see that Hill finished the season with 41 points to Surtees 40. But because Graham dropped the result from the Belgian Grand Prix, Surtees took the title despite having more non-finishes and one fewer point. One. And this has happened before. Well, I say before, I mean after, but in my lifetime anyway. Schumacher won the championship in 1994 by one point. Ironically, it was Graham's son that he beat. And then there was Hamilton in 2008 and Raikkonen in 2007. It would actually be interesting to see what modern championships would have changed hands under this system. 2008 probably would. 2016 might have. But, you know, you can't alter history unless you've got a time machine, and if I had a time machine, the first thing I'd be doing is telling Jordan Pickford to stay where he is because that Italian dude is sending it straight down the middle. I drank a lot last night. Unfortunately, it's going Rome. But back to 1964. Hill and BRM lost the title by two points instead of winning it by just the one, and Hill was the only driver in 1964 to drop points. But one historical thing did come of this. Surtees became the only man to win the title on two and four wheels. Well, the World Championship, that is. But then in 1965, it happened again, although it was not as close this time. BRM dropped 16 points to just four dropped by Lotus, and that was the second of the two times that Clark scored 100% of the available points on, on offer. But while Graham Hill only realistically lost one title thanks to these drop scores, there is a man who would have been very, very happy to see that rule sent into orbit like Chris Waddle's penalty at Italia 90. And that man is Alain Prost. So in 1988, as explained before, the rules changed so that it was the best 11 races of the season that count towards your final point score. And this season is of course where the two McLarens of Prost and Senna went and not only got 15 of 16 pole positions, but 15 of 16 wins as well. Again, something that nobody has done since, not even Mercedes. But I don't think many younger fans of the sport will realise that in 1988, under the current rules, well I say the current rules, the post-1991 rules, it would have been Prost's championship. 
now before I go into the nitty gritty of the story, people are going to use this as an opportunity to say that I'm just shitting on Senna and I'm going to use every opportunity to rag on him, but I'm not. This is what happened. I'll also add that the point system in 1988 was slightly different to how it is now or between 1991 and 2010. In 1988 the point system was 964321 up until 1990 and then 1991 onwards they upped it to 106,4321. And then they changed that again in 2020 to the 2518 down to 10th system. So long story short, and again the results will go up on your screen, Prost finished the season on 105 points compared to Senna's 94. But because of the drop scores, that changed to 90 place 87, because Prost had to drop his second place at the Hungarian, Belgian and Japanese Grand Prix, while Senna only had to drop points from the races at Estoril and Jerez. His other three drop rounds would have been his disqualification at Brazil, his retirement from Monaco, and the 10th place at Monza. But then the following year, the system actually worked in Prost's favour, and we can debate the ins and outs of Suzuka until the cows come home, and that's a whole nother video entirely, which I probably have done at some point, but remaking it's going to be a bit of a pain in the ass because, you know, not being able to use images and stuff like that. Going into those final two rounds at Suzuka and Adelaide, the situation was Senna had to win both races to win the title, which would have given him 78 points to Prost 76. As it happened, Senna lost 76 to 60. And whether you agree with the disqualification or not, the fact remains that Senna still retired at Adelaide, which meant he still failed to win both Grand Prix required to take the title. Even if he had kept the win at Suzuka, he retired at Adelaide. He would have lost either way. But then it went in Senna's favour the following year in 1990 with the whole firing Prost off at Suzuka Pro Gamer move. Prost dropped two points at the end of the season while Senna dropped zero. And James Hunt's commentary said it all when the dust was obscuring both the McLaren and the Ferrari. And that makes Ayrton Senna champion this year. That's actually a pretty decent impression, I'm going to stick with that. But under the post-1991 system, so no drop rounds and 10 points for a win, Prost would have actually won the title in 1983, 1984 and 1988 on top of the other four championships he won, which would have made him the first of three seven-time world champions along with Schumacher and Hamilton. And there are claims out there that the then drop score rule and nine points for a win system screwed Prost out of those three titles, but they didn't. Let's be honest, they didn't. In 1983, neither he or PK dropped points, and in 1984 he lost the title because of the half points that were awarded at Monaco. It's the irony of, had he let Senna go through, he would have actually won because he would have... And so on. Again, you can't change history. Now, I've watched Formula 1 since 1994, so I've never seen the system in place. And I look at it and I think, how can a guy who had an 11 or 12 point lead in the standings still lose the title? But, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't get it. It's like the contrived BTCC point system when they had the different classes. Because you travel all over the world, you race, you win. You come second, you come third, you know, you still get a podium, you still score a lot of points. But the FIA then goes, well, actually, this result, this result, this result, this result, they don't matter. And having looked all over the internet for, for explanations and things like that and seeing how it would have affected the championships through the maths, because I can't do the maths myself... People are going, well, you know, 1988, it's a technicality, it's, uh, we put an asterisk next to it, it's Prost's title. No, it isn't. It's Senna's title. Look, it's right there. The rule is strange, it's contrived, but there's nothing we can do about it. We can't change history. But here's some interesting extra information for you, and this is something I, I read through going through Reddit and forums and things like that on the subject. Joe Gartner was 5th at the 1984 Italian Grand Prix, and Yannick Dalmas was 5th at the 1987 Australian Grand Prix. But because of the drop score rule, they're actually shown as not scoring any points in their careers. Which is mental. So what do you think? Drop scores? Shall they come back? Or does it really matter because of the, the way that Formula 1 cars are these days? They're too reliable and things like that, or there's not enough competition? You know, stuff like that. Let me know what you think down in the comments and get a discussion going. I know this is more of like a story timey type video, but still, I want to hear opinions on things and, you know, get that discussion going because I don't know if it actually helps the algorithm or not, but I like seeing what people think. So this has been a rundown of how the drop score rule changed the winner of not just one, but two championships. And if you thought this video was interesting, 
give it one of these. And if you want to see more motorsport related videos like this, talking about the history, talking about how different motorsports work, reacting to motorsport news, or even the esports stuff I do because I am racing BTCC cars on Wednesday night, uh, get that subscribe button clicked with the bell on so you get all the latest. Big thanks as always go out to the patrons of Patreon for their continued support. And if you do want to support the channel on a more personal level or just join in Discord or follow me on Twitter, Instagram and all that stuff, I'll leave everything you need down in the description box for you so it's easy to find. So until next time, I've been Aidan Ward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.